Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great people good morning. of the Sarasota Design Conference, sharing your Sunday with us. Um, yesterday, I was wondering, we, we, I, no, actually, our committee decided we should not have a workshop on Sundays anymore. We should have it on Saturdays. So uh, you are spared for next time. Um, thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, thank you very much, Christy Walson from TLC Engineering Solutions for accepting this challenge. Uh, I know she's uh, done this workshop before, but I don't know if she's ever done it on a Sunday morning. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, our theme, our conference theme being um, design with vision, it was, we wanted to find a workshop theme that um, tied in with how we are going to look at the future and our energy guzzling lifestyle and design style. Um, as you all know, AIA Florida is, um, is pushing ahead with a carbon zero agenda. And we want uh, obviously our governing bodies to do the same. But in the meantime, we as architects need to be as equipped as possible and adept as possible in offering our services as architects as efficiently as possible. So I thought um, the conference has many aspects to it in terms of learning. We do get a lot of credits, but since every person has different learning styles, some people learn uh, better by listening to others uh, show how things are done but some people work better by doing it themselves. So that's the idea of the workshop is you learn what you learn and you can take back to your own chapter as well. That was one of our aims in doing this. Um, obviously physical sessions then, and it was very, very productive. And we had an output from that uh, workshop that we were able to take to the city. We were able to take to the Bayfront group. Um, we had participants from different chapters. So without further ado, Christy, um, if you can, you know, obviously talk about uh, yourself and your work, but also just give an idea of how we're going to do today, because I know we talked about changing it slightly depending on number of participants. So if mm -hmm. you can just give the outline and also uh, <clears throat> highlight when we will be giving a break approximately. Uh Got it. I got you covered, Zelma. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just pop over to here. I always like to know when I'm gonna get to eat and when I'm gonna get a break. So I figured I'd put this stuff down so everybody can see it. I'll pop back to here frequently today. Um, so I'm Christy Walson. I'm with TLC Engineering Solutions. We're headquartered in Orlando, Florida, um, but we have offices all throughout the Southeast United States, um, well, and Philadelphia and Chicago and Houston, I mean, um, Dallas. So we're, we're, I guess I can't say Southeast anymore. Um, I uh, manage our energy services group out of our Orlando office. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, but I, am, I focus on sustainability in our energy services group. Um, what we do is we focus on sustainable projects, energy, water, commissioning, um, energy auditing, all, all the good stuff, in my opinion. So uh, so today, um, we're going to be doing a variety of things. So first of all, I just want to let everyone know it's Sunday. You're here, but it's still Sunday. So it's going to be real casual. Um, we're going to take quite a few breaks. Um, and if we need more, that's OK. Um, and I want you to feel just like, like you're all probably um, at home or most of you are at home. Just relax. Don't feel like you have to hold yourself in one position the whole time. Um, that can get very tiring. Um, I want this to be interactive. So, um, and if you have a question, feel free to pop in or Selma, is there a hand raise function or you want yes. to do it that way? Yes, everybody can raise hand. Um, do you know where to do it? It's at the um, kind of bottom of your screen. You can send smiley faces and thumbs up and all that kind of stuff. Or you okay. could just, I, I, yeah. I can see all of you, so you can just raise your hand too. Exactly. 
There you go. There Dog. we are. Good job. <laughs> and then let me see if this is possible. Okay. If you could do me a favor, I'm doing it myself. If you hold your uh, cursor uh, over your face, and there's three dots that appear in the upper right corner. And you click that and you see there's an option three down that says rename. Please rename yourself to whatever you want me to call you during this workshop. Some people kind of, most people are there. One person has a uh, initial as their first name. So just put your whatever name you want me to call you during this so that I know what your name is. All right. Thank you for that. That'll help me. Oh, no, I did the wrong thing. Uh -huh. I just renamed you by mistake. <laughs> oh, hey, <laughs> you guys can call me Soma today. That's fine. I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. OK, so what we're going to do today is um, dive into it. We're talking about, let me go back here. We're talking about um, carbon zero today. And Selma, you were right. I have given all the components of this workshop at various times. I've never given it all together in one four hour stretch. So my goal today is for it to not feel like four hours. <laughs> I hope it. I hope it's interactive and fun at at parts and informative enough to make it go by quickly. So, and then, um, uh, so what we're gonna be doing is there's two components to carbon um, in the building design and construction. Um, there's operational carbon, which is something we've been talking about for a long time. It's how your building operates, um, the amount of energy your building uses. Um, and all of the carbon that's emitted into the atmosphere as a result of that energy use, you know, when you take it back to the utility plant. But there's also embodied carbon, which we're going to be covering um, at the end of this, which is the other part of this carbon pie. And you'll see when we get to the embodied carbon portion, the two, the way we design now with our high performance design strategies and, um, you know, AIA's Design for Excellence Framework and ASHRAE's um, High Performance Buildings Standards and LEED and all that stuff, embodied carbon and operational carbon are actually, over the next 30 years, going to be equal if we don't start talking more about embodied carbon. So that's why I thought this workshop would be a great opportunity to talk about the whole carbon pie as opposed to just one or the other, and we bring it all together. So. I'm going to dive in. Um, and if at any point we need a break, you let me know, raise your hand, um, and we'll get going. You're also going to be seeing a lot of me trying to manage uh, multiple screens <laughs> at the same time. So, okay. All right. So, can everyone see uh, the screen that says WD SUG Middle School? Okay, cool. All right. Okay, so what we're gonna start out with first is this case study um, on a middle school that we did in Manatee County. It was our Fort Myers group um, that did a energy use reduction case study on WD Sug Middle School in Manatee. And so I'm gonna blow through some of these slides. There's a lot of words, but the, the intent was to take an existing middle school that they already had um, use it as a prototype, look at the energy bills, and determine the way to bring the next middle school down to um, their target was a 25 EUI. You're going to hear the term EUI a lot today. It um, refers to energy use intensity. It's the way that we normalize the energy use of a building by square foot. So EUI is the unit of energy. We, we use KBTU per square foot of the building per year. And the reason we do it this way is because then I can take a middle school here and a middle school, um, you know, in Sarasota or Fort Myers, and I can say, okay, this one is running at 65 KBTU per square foot per year, or I just say 65 EUI. We want to do 20% better than that, or we're running at that, that, that you know, 
now we're running at about what our peers are running at. So it's a way to normalize um, by a square foot when you have various size types of buildings. And the goal was to get this down to a 25 EUI. They used this other middle school called Mona Jane um, as a prototype because they already had the utility bills. And this was the rough order of operations that they used. Um, and it, it's you'll see as we go through this, if you have a building that you can look at that already has its utility bills, um, it's much better to start there and see how a building's actually running because it's very difficult to, um, you know, with a design to kind of crystal ball how this operation, um, how the occupancy flow is going to go, which it plays a huge part in the energy use in a building. So the first step was they took um, 20 AIA's 2030 challenge. Um, so what that does is it takes a whole bunch of operating buildings. Uh, people report um, their data, and now you have this little scatter plot of a variety of different building types. You see along the horizontal axis, you have um, floor area, and then along the vertical axis, you have that EUI that I was talking about, the KBTU per square foot per year. And we're able to see, okay, where are a lot of the buildings in our area operating? So we have a question. Go ahead, Brad. Thank you. Uh, this is something that comes up quite a bit is what's the baseline uh, for different projects because Sarasota County is on the 2030 challenge and uh, you know we're starting to get to that really difficult range. So that's always a question. That is, that is the question. That's yeah. always, that's the first thing I ask when someone asks me the energy model because that's a great question. What you're doing with an energy model is you're not forecasting energy use necessarily. You're um, comparing your building against some other building, right? And so. Um, Conversation. Okay. So what happens? Someone's unmuted. Selma, I think you're on it. Okay. Anyway. What happens is um, that baseline for the 2030 challenge can be one thing. And then the baseline for code, energy code compliance can be a completely different thing. And it, it, that is actually the case. So 2030, when it first came out, its baseline was the 2003 CBEX data, which is what Energy Star um, goes off of. Um, CBEX has updated to 2012 now. Yes, that's eight years ago. They're always a bit behind, but um, CBEX is a commercial building energy consumption survey, which is basically all the buildings that uh, enter their information into Energy Star and it gathers that data. Um, LEED, your baseline is going to be different, right? And so LEED uses an ASHRAE 90.1 2010 baseline. Energy Code uses its own current Energy Code baseline and 2030 uses its own fairly outdated baseline. So Brad, like the answer is not always super clear. You have to say, what are we doing this energy model for? What are we trying to accomplish? If it's pass energy code, it's gonna be one baseline. If it's get lead points, it's gonna be another baseline. You have to find that out, the final purpose of the model. And you sometimes are gonna be doing multiple baselines. And then, of course, um, personally, I also like to throw in actual operating buildings make great baselines because then you can put real measures in place to reduce your energy consumption, which is what we're doing here. Um, Mona Jane, the initial calibrated school, was running at a 55 EUI. And the goal of this uh, case study was to bring the building down, bring the next building down to a 25. Hassan. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I was just curious that um, is kind of an ac action, you know, is also started, I'm sure, that Europe and Japan and some other countries. What is their baseline and where do we fit in, you know, in that overall global scheme of things? Our carbon emissions versus, for instance, Japan. 
Japan <coughs> or anywhere else in the Europe? Well, that's an excellent question. I don't actually know the answer to that question, although I, I could Google around and probably get some data for you. Um, I, I have to say, one of the problems with comparing ourselves against other countries is all of our databases tend to be very country centric, right? So Energy Star is very much United States. I believe Canada is in there too. Um, and that's how they gather their data. This global exchange of data may be happening on some level, but I haven't tapped into that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So this Mona Jane uh, initial starter for uh, getting our, um, you know, to calibrate where we think we start, where we think we're starting to try and get down to 25 uh, kBTU per square foot per year. Um, the initial uh, goal was to get um, a very good infiltration rate at the envelope. So code is 0.4 CFM per square foot of exterior wall. And the goal of this project was to get down to 0.25 uh, uh, CFM per square foot um, of exterior. And you can see they did all the testing that's required in order to verify that they were hitting the infiltration rates. In our climate, infiltration rate makes a really big difference um, in your initial equipment sizing. So that, that will help with energy consumption. We did a climate analysis for them. This is something we do on every project. You always wanna look and see what your climate is doing and how it's gonna impact the energy use in your building. And then we took um, the building, the Mona Jane, and we calibrated an energy model to pretty closely match the energy use in the building. Because once we get there, we can start applying measures to bring down the energy use. So this orange line is what was energy modeled. It's real good there where we're overlapping lines. This blue line is the actual measured data at this um, Mona Jane Middle School. And so we took um, the energy model and got it as close as we could uh, to meeting the actual energy use, not just over the whole year, but even month by month, trying to get it very close to what the building was actually doing. And you see, you know, like all schools, June to July is a very low energy consumption because nobody's there. Breaking it down further, it's good to know where you're using the energy within your building. So we've got you know, in Florida, you're always going to, cooling is always going to be the biggest use. Um, and so cooling is certainly number one. Uh, fans, because the fans are directly related to the cooling, the fans at the air handling units are also a biggie. Um, interestingly enough, space heating, this orange, isn't usually this big, but with a school, um, you have a lot of outside air, a lot of ventilation that you have to bring in in order to meet ventilation code. And so what happens is when you bring, during the winter months, when you bring in cold air, you have to reheat it before it goes into the space or else everybody's gonna, the thermal comfort's not gonna be there. Everybody's gonna be very cold. So the heating here is uh, increased a bit over what we normally see with like a commercial office building because, because of the amount of outside air in here. And then the service water heating, this is a middle school, so it has a cafeteria, uh, has uh, locker rooms with um, showers. And so uh, that's a little higher than we'd normally see it too, but good to look at the distribution. And then the big brainstorm. So I always like to do this. Um, sometimes we have the time, sometimes project doesn't have the time, but if you have the time, sitting down with the whole team, and talking through just throwing ideas on the board and seeing what sticks is pretty important because what, what it takes to get to a low EUI is not always what you like the normal of what you would think it would be. It's very dependent on climate, building type, building operation. And so even building location, like in terms of specifically what site are you on? So you really do wanna sit down and have this conversation, talk through ideas, um, it's great to have the contractor on the phone so that we can talk money as well, or if you have a cost estimator, and just bring everybody into that conversation. 
and then you start to run it in the energy model, right? So um, we'll do a number of iterations on the energy model. We start with this prototype, which is the calibrated Let's Mona Jane. Trying to get everybody involved to everybody's trying to get their own. And then we start to apply um, energy conservation measures or ECMs. So in this part, on this slide, we were looking only at glass. And you can see this line here divides between monolithic glass and insulated glass. And so we took a look to see, um, and then down uh, along the horizontal axis, you can see, so uh, monolithic glass, you're gonna have about a U value of 0.96, close to an R1. Um, glazing goes by U value, walls go by, our value at the end of the day, it's all insulating value. Um, and then it, <clears throat> insulated glass tends to be in the U.4 range. Um, so like R2, a little better than that. Um, solar heat gain coefficient, um, that's what inhibits the solar radiation from coming into your building when the sun is having direct solar contact with your glass. Um, the lower the number, the better job it does keeping that radiation out. And so we analyzed a variety of U values, so insulating values and solar heat gain coefficients to get to the optimized um, solution. Um, and you see just by changing the glass and playing around with the glass, we were able to get the, from prototype, get it down uh, just over 3% better than what we started at. So just by changing glass, we got, a 3% betterment or 3.2% betterment. Now, I'll say this up, up front, they did not necessarily employ all of the things we recommended on this middle school because there's always budget, right? And a solar heat gain glass of 0.15 is expensive. And so our job was to tell them how to get there. And then it was their job to decide what to implement. We did the same, same thing with the wall insulation. Uh, we took it from a, you know, the prototype is at 15.4. We actually checked to see uh, what slightly worse insulation would do, and then also slightly better and much better. Um, you can see insulation in our climate doesn't have a huge effect. However, We'll, we're going to talk more about that later when we do our work, um, our exercise. Same with the roof insulation. This particular project has a pretty big roof area. So it actually had a bit more of an impact than typically changing the roof insulation will. But ASHRAE, which drives the code minimum insulation, typically They've done their research and that particular in, uh, R value that they specify as being your baseline tends to be pretty optimized for our climate. Continuing, so this is, the, this is a look at all the iterations. Um, what we like to do is we like to package all of the options that, um, that we come up with and provide like a, uh, a set of energy cost saving measures, which is how we get you to where you're trying to get. Um, so for instance, this package, package A, got the building from a 53.8 EUI down to a 35.9, because we all know that some of the options that we select um, are gonna be cost prohibitive. So we do wanna, you know, we do wanna be like, if, if you're not gonna do this, we don't wanna just leave you in a big black hole. We wanna tell you, okay, Here's a bit more cost friendly way to get it down, maybe not all the way to 25, but to get it down as far as as far as you can. Christy, there's a yes. question from Steve. Can you explain the difference between R value and U value again? Yes. Yeah. So in short, Steve, R value is or U value is one over R. They're the inverse of each other. So if you have an R five wall, the U value is 0.2, it's one over five. You're muted. But what do they represent? They are 
they are the insulating value of the wall. So, and we're going to get into this. Uh, we're kind of skipping ahead, but that's okay. That's what we're doing today. There's three methods of heat transfer, right? You have a wall and its job, besides keeping rain and, you know, debris and stuff out of your building, is to keep things inside cool in our climate and to keep the hot outside, right? And so the three methods of heat transfer are conduction, which is basically the hot just trying to get into the inside of the building. And you've got convection, which is air blowing over a surface, which we don't uh, account for in load calculations. But if you have a convection oven, basic same physics behind it, then there's radiation, which only happens on a building from the sun beating directly onto the, uh, like a transparent surface like glass. So our value is the thing that inhibits conduction. It stops the hot from getting inside. And we'll go through actually the, the equation that we use to come up with the heat load. Um, I'll be talking about that when we're doing our exercise. Did that answer your question? Christy, okay. I have a basic historic question. Why do we have to have the two values? Why can we not just move ahead with one way of looking at energy transfer? I've always figured that was a question for architects because it's a glass, you know, it's only glass that uses U value. Um, I don't know, but maybe because they wanted more decimal points. I don't know. <laughs> it really doesn't make sense. It just confuses everybody. Right. I think the glass industry was over here working on the glass stuff. I think the wall industry, the you know, insulation industry was over here doing their thing and they didn't talk to each other. <laughs> and that's basically I have to say in the UK, uh, we don't use our value. It's just it's you shown everything is in new value. The codes are in new value. Everything's in new value. And to be fair, our um, our codes are in U values for walls and roof. That's the the assembly value that they give you is a U value that you have to hit. Hassan. Yes, all this based on the heat transfer, all these entities, all these calculations exist, convection and others. But maybe in some cases, one of the one of the thing is maybe much smaller than the other one. So that you know, so negligible value, so that we don't worry about that. That's right. the way I think. Yeah, I think so. They are all the exist though. I, I agree. I think it's people have a hard time. The yeah, lay person has a hard time with decimals. And so, you know, distinguishing like so R7, R13 is just easier from a marketing side, too. Okay, we're gonna speed through this and we'll get to our exercise. So um this was package B, and we were able to, um, with a variety of considerations that came up in the brainstorming session and then ref were refined with our energy model, we were able to um, take it from that initial 53.8 down to 27 EUI, so getting closer to the goal. Um, and uh, however, if you look through these options, we've got ACB is air-cooled air beams. Um, uh, sorry, active chilled beams. Sorry. Um, so that's um, that. That's a whole different strategy of cooling the building. We've got energy recovery. We're reducing our kitchen makeup. We have a water cooled chiller, which is not typical for a school. Typically, we'd be doing an air cooled chiller, depending on depending on the square footage. But a lot of schools prefer air cooled chillers. But they have terrible efficiencies, and water cooled chillers have much better efficiency condenser, water heat recovery, upgraded envelope, um, and the whole this whole enhanced package, which also comes with an enhanced cost, is at 27. But if you're headed for net zero, and if your goal is net zero, let's get, whoops, hold on, let me figure out how to get backwards. Any money that you put into these measures, even if they're costly, even if they're more expensive than what you pay your water cooled chill or your energy recovery. If you calculate it as a dollars of installed equipment per watt saved, 
So let's say energy recovery saves you a certain number of watts if we're going to talk about it in the saved energy. Those dollars spent to save that watt are going to be less dollars than the cost of installed solar on your roof per watt. And so this is what I always tell people. If your goal is net zero, get your building. Don't even, don't even worry about solar to start with. Get your building as low as you can. Get that EUI as low as you can on the interior before you hit the solar. Your PV array is going to be much smaller. And when you're talking about $2 per watt of installed solar, which is about what things are running right now, it, it fluctuates, but uh, let's just call it that to be conservative. You're gonna spend less than $2 per saved watt on the interior um, than, than that $2 on the roof. So get your, get your buildings loads down as far as you can before you start going to the roof with your solar. Because that's the next, oh, go ahead, Joe, or Brad. Sorry, uh, does that include considerations for operational maintenance cost? You know, when you're doing the building cost versus PV? So typically, um, it, I, I would say it depends, right? We are, in our exercises here, we are only looking at energy savings, energy cost savings. And you're talking more about a life cycle cost analysis. and so what ends up happening is we'll present this um, set of options to let's say the school board or whoever. What they tend to do after that is they'll have, they'll have a design and construction requirement that requires a life cycle cost analysis for any non-standard design feature. And so then what we'll do is they'll pick and choose what they're wanting to look at, like the water cooled versus air cooled, that's very typical. They'll say, okay, now you got to do a life cycle cost analysis between the air cooled and the water cooled so we can make sure it's fitting within our parameters. Um, and if it's not, make a decision based on that. So that'd be the next step. So Christy, is there a like a percentage rule of thumb <clears throat> between baseline and net zero? Depends on the building type, because if this were a hospital, it would be much different from a school. Um, most of the schools that I've done because they have that lull in the, in the summer. Um, so they, they tend to, you tend to be able to hit a lower EUI. EUI is the cumulative energy use across the whole year. So if you have a month or two that you're not operating at full capacity, that helps your energy use intensity across the whole year. So, um, for a school, I would say if you can get it under 30, EUI, you're doing pretty good. Yeah, I'm talking about construction costs. Oh, um, it really depends. It really depends on. Um, I mean, you can't just say there's a 20% increase or, or, you know, there isn't, you haven't found that rule of thumb. No, because every package, depending on where you are and what you're doing and what type of school it is, is not is going to have different options here, which is going to drive that cost. Um, and no, I mean, okay. maybe somebody does. I haven't seen a, a solid one, though. Okay. Okay, so this was our... Um, this was our renewable energy um, analysis. You can see we've got enhanced package A and enhanced package B. Enhanced package A got us to like a 35 EUI and enhanced package B got us to a 27. You can see this green line, the, thir the 310, the 310 KW, that's the size of the PV array that you need to offset um, to offset yourself to get to net zero. You can see when we brought down the loads, like I was just saying, your PV array is much smaller um, to offset the rest of the loads, the lower you get your EUI. So that's, that's what I was saying. And that's gonna be part of our exercise. Let's see what we're looking at for time. And this is uh, <laughs> return on investment, <clears throat> just simple payback with no maintenance costs in it. So the next step would be life cycle cost analysis. 
nine, it's about 940. Let's take like a three minute stretch break and then we'll come back um, and do the exercise where we're gonna do breakout rooms and stuff like that. So I'll see you in about three, four minutes. Let's take All right, we're back. Okay. Everybody feel ready to uh, talk to each other. We're going to do a team exercise here. We're going to, it's a, well, it's set up like a football game. And since yesterday was college football Saturday, uh, we've got three quarters of solid play uh, that's going to happen right now. If we get to the fourth quarter, um, if we have time, we'll do the fourth quarter. You'll see why it won't be a big deal if we don't get to it. Um, uh, but now we're going to take what we just learned with the middle school uh, prototype or case study, and we're going to apply it in real life or in game. Um, and so what's going to happen here is you guys are going to be, Selva, what are the team names again? I forget. You're muted. Team Neutron and Team Zero. Okay. So someone's gonna tell you who's in which team because I don't actually know. Um, so this is the energy modeling game. You guys are gonna be competing against each other. I'm gonna be live energy modeling all of your options that you choose within this game. And um, <clears throat> we originally did this uh, presentation at Green Build in 2011, uh, no, it was 2010. Um, and Kim Shin, lead fellow at TLC, and Kurt Teske, lead fellow at HKS in Dallas, um, originally did this presentation. I happen to be one of the little wizards behind the curtain modeling um, this 150 person green build presentation game. It started there and we've been doing it across the country ever since. Uh, it is certified for AIA credit, but I'm sure Selma, <clears throat> you've certified this workshop. Yes. You know, I know you've done other things, so. Yes, it's for uh, HSW credits. Perfect um, example of knowing what your baseline is. Um, you're starting with a baseline building here today. I picked a middle school because we're talking net zero today. And the reason schools get targeted a lot for net zero is because um, they have a lot of opportunity. So. There's that lull in the summer where they're not running. So that cuts down on their energy use intensity. But they also tend to be um, single story or, one, or two story, which means they have a lot of roof space for PV. So they, they are a really good case study for net zero because you're able in a lot of instances to fit the amount of PV you need on the roof onto the footprint of the roof. Whereas like a 20 story high rise, that's just not possible because you have a lot of vertical energy use instead of horizontal spread out. So, and utility costs are fairly large operating um, cost for schools that, you know, it tends to be fairly large for them. So this is how the game's gonna look. Uh, quarter one, I'm going to allow you to take the baseline, which we'll go over in a second, and change the massing and orientation. Quarter two, we're going to be looking at the building envelope. Quarter three, we're going to be looking at internal loads. And quarter four, um, we're going to not do sequentially right now. I'm going to save it for um, at the end of our presentation workshop time where if you guys don't have a lot of questions, because I saved it for questions and answers near the end, we can do the fresh start real quick. It doesn't take that long. So here's your baseline. The baseline is compliant with ASHRAE 90.1 2007, which is not our building code right now. Uh, our building code has, is, um, depending on where you are, could be ASHRAE 2013, um, could be ASHRAE 2016. So we're starting with a 38.6 KBTU per square foot per year. So everybody unmute for a second because we're going to have a quick discussion. Looking at the pie, looking at the electricity pie and looking at the bar charts, what do you note? 
about the energy use of this building. Cooling is cool. the highest cost or usage. And lighting is quite high. Anything else? I'm not leading you. I'm just uh, asking. Heating is very low. <laughs> and hot water is hot has water a pretty something big we sliver. could target. We so the game is fairly limited just because I'm sitting here doing two energy models, you know, in the course of an hour. But on a normal normal um, day, domestic hot water fits significant. We could touch. Okay, so. Um, so lighting and cooling are directly related to each other because lights, I call lights a double whammy. Lights provide, well, first you need electricity for them to turn on, right? So there's electricity use right there, but it doesn't stop there. Lights produce heat to the space that we have to cool. They're a load in our space that we account for when we size our HVAC equipment. And so they're double whammy because if you bring them down, you bring down the electrical use for them just to turn on and you bring down um, the HVAC use, the cooling use. Uh, now you sometimes in heating climates, it might serve to increase your heating, but in our climate, that's not that big a deal because heating is a very small sliver of the pie. And then on the miscellaneous equipment side, I'm, we just as, as people, use more and more process loads as technology develops. We're plugging in our phones and, you know, we didn't always have to plug in our phones, but now we're plugging in our phones. We have um, all kinds of process loads. Typically, um, that's not something we can do a whole lot about. It does produce heat to the space. We account for it in our HVAC sizing, um, but typically we can't tell people don't plug in your phones. Th those are convenience things that are there for the people to use and produce functionality in the space. So we, while there are a couple strategies, we're not gonna be looking at them today. Okay, so we're into quarter one. I purposefully don't tell you a whole lot. You just know, let me go back real quick. You just know that you have an L-shaped building with this, amount of energy use. Um, we'll get to the envelope characteristics in a second. You're only looking at massing and orientation of the building. And you're presently at a 38.6 kBTU per square foot. The winner, winning team, is the team that can get this 38.6 down lowest. And I will go to second and third decimal points if it comes down to that, but it's never actually come down to that. So. So Christy, explain to us how you want the teams to propose just yep. by internal discussion and then how do they come, you know, what do they come back to you with? Right, so we're gonna break you into two teams when the breakout session happens. When you're broken out, I don't think you can see what you're seeing right now. So take a quick screenshot because this is what you're gonna be discussing and uh, put it somewhere <laughs> that you can look at. There you go, perfect. I love the phone, what a great idea. I wouldn't have even thought to do that. Um, you're having to choose uh, first the shape that you wanna change the building to be in. You can leave it as an L, that's an option. So you cannot touch the shape. Um, so you have cross shape, you have square, T shape, you have rectangle. I show the aspect ratio underneath it, that is locked in and then you have eight shape it's gonna it's a two-story fifty thousand square foot building right now it will remain a two-story fifty thousand square foot building it's not going to change its size or anything like that and then you have to choose so you choose your shape then in row one two and three you have orientation so what you'll come back to me with is if you <clears throat> you'll say christy we're changing our building to be the t shape row three orientation, okay? What I'd like for you guys to do is, usually this is a five minute discussion, so let's do a five minute breakout room. And um, when you come back to us, you'll uh, have selected one person to be your representative. And I'd like for you to tell me what your choice was and why. 
and we will flip teams each time saying it because sometimes it's harder virtually, but sometimes team two will change their choice based on what team one decided to do because of their reasoning. But that's why I flip flop it. You know, that's kind of, you know, that's really like going for the winning game thing, but, um, but that's a thing. So, um, Christy, can so you go back to your other screen, which had the mod, the pie chart, because I think it's helpful to have that uh, screenshot as well. And okay. don't we don't we need to know where North is? Oh, it's, it's see that I know it's tiny, but the oh, N is, is this uh, way. But on the and other map, yeah. How do we? It's up as well. Go for it. Oh, uh, it's up. This. Oh, there it is. Okay, see. okay. Didn't right see. here. Yeah, got it. we got too fancy. Let me go back. Did everyone get a screenshot of this? Uh, no. Not, not me. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. So Second. I have two groups of five and I'm, I don't know where I am because I can't seem to, because I'm the host, I can't add myself to a breakout room. So I'll figure out what to do for myself. Yep. Everyone's back. Oh, we got booted. So that's how that works. Yep, you're back. <laughs> how, how was that? No <laughs> warning. We were all talking, and all of a sudden, that's it. <laughs> See the <laughs> countdown? There should be a countdown. Yeah, no, we saw it, but you know, okay. you ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the time clock. <laughs> well, that's what I was telling uh, Selma. I, I do this for um, college students a lot. And I always tell them that's how it works in the industry. You think you have a deadline and then they tell you they need it two days earlier and then you have to just do it. So you just got to figure it out. Um, okay, so uh, Selma, I don't think we actually, did you say who was team, team Neutron and who was team zero? Um, once you got there, you know, but I have a list here. Okay, we so we don't know if we're Neutron or zero. Oh, okay, Neutron was Baron, Brad, Charlie, Joe Todd. So everybody else is zero, zero. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So can I get the representative for Team Neutron to tell me what your selection was and why? That's you, Brad. Brad. Uh, well, we, we jumped to uh, the classic row three rectangle east-west orientation. Um, and then we learned about the daylight harvesting little ghost line in there. So then we started having second thoughts, but let's just, if, if we're allowed to change, let's stick with that for now. All right. <clears throat> okay. What daylight, what daylight harvesting ghost line? Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll fill you in. <laughs> I was trying to explain, I think. Uh, I popped in to Team Neutron's breakout session just to test out our capabilities. And while I was in there, I told them that that faint line interior is offset to the interior of the um, perimeter of the building. That is 15 feet. And the reason for it is in quarter three, we're going to be talking about daylight harvesting and a uh, typical daylight harvesting uh, zone depth is 15 feet. So just for scale purposes, I wanted to, um, when they asked the question about scale, I was trying to give them reference by showing that that was 15 feet. So I'm just going to note it down. T Team Neutron is row two? Row three, row rectangle. Two. Okay, Team Zero. Yep, so Christy, I had a quick question because we also landed on rectangle row three. <laughs> just, to, just for the massing um, to minimize the east and west exposure, um, we did not know about that little line being 15 feet for daylight harvesting, but I think that reinforces why we would want to pick that. But for the sake of this discussion, should we pick something else because we're picking the same thing? Well, you would be surprised with uh, 15 options, how often people choose the same thing, yeah. or the two teams choose the same thing. Um, I would say keep it. I always recommend just keep it because the next quarter has, there's absolutely no way. Well, there's very little chance that you guys will pick all the same thing because there's too many okay. options. 
So we're gonna go row three, rectangle, okay. So how it works, because I have to put this into the energy model, is I'm going to get you started on quarter two. And we'll talk through quarter two. There's quite a bit to talk through before we break you out. But then once you're back in your discussion rooms, I'll go ahead and run both models with your quarter one selections. And I'll pop into your break room and just tell you what the impact was, kind of where you're sitting based on that choice. Remember doesn't matter who's ahead in quarter one. It's the last quarter of the game where you win it. So don't get discouraged if things didn't go your way in quarter one. So and also, I, uh, I will again give you the one minute notice. Um, and I, you are assigned to the same room. So as soon as I open the room, you end up in the same group. Yeah, you're going to have more time for uh, quarter two, there's a lot more to discuss. So you're gonna be broken out for about 10 minutes that time with me popping in there briefly. Okay, let's talk quarter two. Okay, we did massing and orientation. That's always the first thing that you're gonna look at. I would say typically as an MEP engineer, I that ship has most of the time sailed by the time I get involved in a project, unfortunately. But um, this is why we do this exercise. Um, is because we're hoping to uh, kind of demonstrate how these things can get thought about that early in a project. So hopefully you've already thought about it by the time I get involved. Quarter two is all about the building envelope. So <clears throat> we've got five things, five characteristics we're gonna discuss here. You get to select three modifications. So out of A, B, C, D, E, um, you get to choose three of those. And then with eat within, Steve, do you have a question? No, I just took a picture of the screen. Okay, okay. Um, within each of those five options, there are sub options that you have to select. So this is why you're gonna be discussing it much longer. Okay, this is another good one to take a picture of. Um, okay, this is where we talk about our value, U value, all the good stuff. So your first option, your first envelope modification is roof insulation. Right now, um, because we're using an ASHRAE 90.1 2007 baseline building, your insulation at the roof is an R20. You have the option to increase it to R24. You can go R30, or you can go crazy and go R42. There's no budget on this project. Don't worry about cost. Um, we are going strictly for energy use. And so that is option A or uh, envelope modification A, pretty simple. B is exterior wall insulation. So you're starting out with a steel framed construction right. with, R with R13 bat insulation um, on the, between the sets. The workshop, I didn't up for it. No, it's about it. We got to mute some folks, I think. Working on it. Okay. Um, the reason, if you look here, uh, the right-hand column on the exterior wall insulation, the reason you have R13 bat, but your assembly R value is R7, is because every place that you have a stud has no insulation. So that R7 is the average our value of your wall. Um, that's how, that, that is the, it, right there, that is the impact of what continuous insulation can do for you. Because when you have that thermal break, um, it, the average comes down quite a bit from what your insulation value is. You have the option to increase, um, so right now there is no continuous insulation on this building. You have the option to add in, um, a one inch polystyrene continuous insulation, or you can add a two inch, or you can add a three inch. So we're adding a layer of continuous insulation. So that'll take you from an R7 to an R11. You can go up to an R19, or you can go crazy and go to an R28. Um, again, trying to not, trying to only think energy and not think, oh my gosh, three inch, three inches of continuous insulation is gonna totally blow up my wall width and all this stuff. Let's not worry about that. 
All right, so those are options A, B. Option C, window glass type. There's a bit to discuss here. We've kind of already touched on it. So you have your U value. Our present U value is a 0.75. That's typically a monolithic or single pane glass. Um, and U value inhibits conduction of heat through the wall. So keeps the hot outside, keeps the cold inside. Our current solar heat gain coefficient is 0.25. So solar heat gain coefficient inhibits that other heat transfer that we have in our buildings in Florida and everywhere where the solar, uh, there's direct solar contact on the window and that heat is transmitting into the space through the windows. Solar heat gain coefficient only impacts windows. It does not impact um, walls. And then the last column is VT, which is visible light transmittance. So right now we have a 0.2. Um, that means that 20% of the light that's outside is being allowed inside. The higher the number of VT, the more light you're allowing into your space from outside. It's just a strict percentage. And so right now it's 0.2. I will tell you in quarter three, we'll talk about daylight harvesting. So um, keep that in mind because you can't do daylight harvesting. Um, it's harder to do daylight harvesting with less visible light transmittance. So, um, okay, so those are your options. And just as a, as a reminder, the lower the U value, the better, better insulating value, the lower the solar heat gain coefficient, the better it is at keeping radiation out of your building. The higher the visible light transmittance, the more light it'll let in. So lower is better in the first two columns, higher is better in the last column. You have an option. So all of your options, options one, two, and three, take you down to a double pane class for the U value. So they all increase your U value. Solar heat gain coefficient wise, you can tell this is, this is, uh, where the options start to vary quite a bit. Option number one is a 0.23, so you're improving it slightly over the baseline. Option number two is a 0.66 solar heat gain coefficient, so you're, you're making it worse on the solar heat gain coefficient side of things. And option number three is somewhere in the middle at a 0.4. And then on the visible light transmittance scale, again, wide variety, you have uh, but they are all better than the baseline in this instance, or I'm sorry, they all let more light in than the baseline. Um, I don't want to sway anybody thinking what's better on visible light. It depends on your design. But you've got uh, 0.47 for option one, you have a 0.73 for option two, you have a 0.5 for option three. This is a lot of numbers, and sometimes they conflict with each other because sometimes better solar heat gain coefficient means worse visible light transmittance. So you have to balance the options, right? You have to optimize. Okay, that was C. Option D, we're starting out with a 40% window to wall ratio. That is the maximum that ASHRAE allows the baseline to be at. So if you design a building with 60% window to wall ratio, you still have to compare yourself against a building with 40% window wall ratio. So that's when we're comparing two buildings. For the purposes of this exercise, we're just looking at energy use intensity. We're not comparing. We're just reducing from a baseline. So um, and maybe that doesn't come into play as much. You can take it down to a 20% window to wall ratio. You can take it up to a 60% or you can basically go crazy and do a 75%, which is essentially 100% of the um, wall below the ceiling, the way we have this um, model set up. So you're hiding all your duct work above the ceiling, but it's 100% uh, it's of the wall below the ceiling is going to be windows. And then finally, uh, option E is exterior shading. When you choose this option, you put you apply it to every window on the project and you get to tell me the projection off of the building 
So when you select this, you also have to tell me, you know, we want a three foot overhang, we want a 10 foot overhang, whatever it's gonna be. That's a lot, there's a lot to talk about. So again, we're gonna break you out. You guys need to select three of these and select the sub option that goes with it. And I will pop in about halfway through and tell you how your quarter one ended up. And that's it. Selma, are we ready to break out? Welcome back. Hi. We're back. All right. I hope that was productive time. Um, so last time, uh, Team Neutron broadcast their selections first. So this time, we're going to let Team Zero uh, tell us what you chose and why. OK, that's, envelope. that's me. Okay. Hi, I'm Nancy. OK, so Team Zero, we decided to, um, for category A roof insulation, to increase that because we felt that that might be a real benefit, especially from Christy's first discussions about saying that you actually gain more with roof insulation than you do with wall insulation. So we thought we would jump on that and maximize that. So we chose A3. And then for B, for the same thinking, we decided to leave the walls at the baseline zero R7, thinking that our gain wouldn't be as great um, in terms of the walls. So for C, we went to a decision where we thought a lower U value would help us, um, a lower SHGC would help us, and perhaps more visible transmittance would help us down the road with daylighting. So we chose C1. Um, for D, we decided to keep the 40% window to wall area. It seemed like a pretty good amount. Given the other options, we really felt three would have been excessive to have all glass walls. That didn't make sense. Um, going to 60 didn't really seem maybe as advantageous. So we left it at 40. We thought it seemed like a pretty good amount given the, the circumstance. And then we decided to go with an E, thinking that perhaps overhangs would help us with solar heat gain. We decided to add four foot overhangs to the building to see if that would help us with our wall um, and heat gain on the walls by having overhangs to kind of give us a shade factor. So that's where we're at for the moment. Great, excellent. Thank you. Okay, Team Neutron, what did you select? Want me to go? Um, we, we left A and B alone, and we went with uh, C1 and D2, uh, which is 60%. Uh, and we also put in a four foot overhang for E. So we're interesting. We're, we're, yeah, we're tracking pretty much the same. I guess the only difference is yeah. they picked uh, A3 and we picked uh, more, more window areas. More window. So. Right. Yeah. You're going to see the difference there. So quarter three, we're going from the outside of the building into the inside of the building and talking about internal loads. Um, we're only touching two internal loads, actually one, which is the lighting, in two different ways. So um, I like to talk about lighting power density first, even though it's second on this list. You have two options. You have lighting power density and you have daylight harvesting. You can do both options in quarter three, which are reduced lighting power density. We'll talk about your sub options in a second and adding daylight harvesting or you can choose one of those options. And then if you are having some type of remorse from quarter two, you can go back and choose one more building modifi uh, envelope modification option. If you're like, oh, if only we could have just done four options. So those are your choices. Here we are. So again, I like to talk daylight harvest or on lighting power density first. Right now, uh, baseline ASHRAE 90.1 school, um, K through 12 school, its baseline lighting power density is 1.2 watts per square foot, okay? You have the choice if you're going to reduce your lighting power density to bring it down to one, you can bring it down to 0.9 or you can bring it down to 0.8. And I always like to just make sure everybody knows that doesn't mean we'll have lower foot candles in the space or less lighting. It just means we're using more efficient lights, light fixtures to get the same amount of foot candles. Um, 
And then your second option in quarter three is to put in daylight harvesting where we have, now we're using that 15 foot perimeter zone that very faintly shows up in the um, massing and orientation blocks. Um, and within that 15 foot perimeter, we'll be able to dim or turn off our lights in that zone when enough daylighting is coming into the space through your windows. Um, we'll have photo cells, photo sensors throughout for the building controls or the lighting controls to do that automatically. So you can choose both of those options and of course select your sub option within the lighting power density or you can choose one of those options and go back to the building envelope modifications and select one more from there. Of course, I'll tell me your sub option too. So we're gonna break you out. I'm gonna go ahead and model your quarter two results. Then we'll bring everybody back and talk about that for a minute. Okay. Opening breakout rooms in how many minutes, Christy? Uh, well, I'll let you know, cause I'll see how quick I model these things. Okay. Okay, we're back. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Can you see uh, like a list of results that I'm sharing with you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So because team zero told us their options first, we will start with their results. So team zero. Okay. Uh, remember in quarter one, you guys did the rect uh, horizontal rectangle and you were at 0.28 betterment over the baseline. You added the roof insulation at R42 and it gave you an additional 0.26. Then you changed out your window glass type to be um, uh, the first type, which was um, basically equivalent to like a solar band 80. Um, and it gave you 14%. Now here's, here's the joy of live energy modeling. <laughs> um, you probably shouldn't have gotten that much. So I'm gonna have to go and look at my model and see what's going on there. But this happens more than you would think. And then you added uh, window exterior shading uh, for at four feet. And that's 1.9%, uh, I'm sorry, 2% betterment. So you gotta, they, they tend to, for the percentages, if it's an incremental um, fractional improvement, they give you a zero, even though you are notching up slightly. Um, and I said, I believe I said a 0.28% improvement before, that's actually 0.28 improvement, sorry about that. Um, you are still improving slightly. Um, right now, the glass is showing as a 14% improvement and uh, the shading give, gave you another two. So if you go down to the bottom, the middle row here are incremental savings and the bottom here is cumulative. So you're sitting at a 16% uh, percent savings. I still need to go and see why it thinks that window made such a difference. We're gonna move over to Team Neutron, okay. And again, your window also gave you a 14, the first option you chose was that solar band 80 equivalent um, and it bumped you up to 14% savings. You increased your window area uh, to 60% from 40 and it dropped you back down 2%. And then you added that exterior shading and it gave you another increase of 2%. So down here at the cumulative savings, you're at a 14% total savings. Now, let's just, because this is how life works, let's just go check something that I think uh, is the reason that, um, that glass is having such an impact. The screen is a little small. Um, let me do it like this. This is like a two minute side diversion here for a moment. What I think we're gonna do, because stuff like this happens all the time, is um, so both of you, now that you've had a chance to talk through quarter three, raise your hand if your team had decided to put daylight harvesting in. So 
uh, y'all picked, uh, one team picked the roof option. The other team didn't pick any increased insulation. Uh, usually I would spend a lot more time on this, but as you guys already made choices outside of the insulation, um, we'll just do this very quickly. I just wanted to explain uh, why the roof probably didn't have as big of an impact um, as you would have thought. So, um, <clears throat> and everybody chooses insulation every time we I do this game. So this Q, can you see my screen? This right here, this equation, Q equals U times A times delta T. So Q is the heat load to the space. That's the thing we are incorporating into the sizing of our mechanical equipment, right? This is how much heat we have to overcome due to the exterior wall, due to the exterior roof, all the envelope loads. This is what we have to overcome. And then we are also adding in lights and people and things like that, but this is just for envelope and just for conduction. So you, like we talked about is one over R. So you can see up here, there's a layer of insulation here. That's what, in addition to some of the other materials, but that's primarily what creates our U. All we can do is raise or lower that, right? A is the area of the piece of envelope, wall, roof, window that you're evaluating. So it's just a simple height times width, right? And a lot of times that's just is what it is, right? You're not gonna change the size of the wall to change the energy use of the building. You have programming that you have to incorporate into this project. And then the delta T is the difference between the outside temperature and the inside temperature. So typically our normal cooling set point in a space will be about 75 degrees. Um, that's what we're aiming for. And then outside, I know it feels a lot hotter in Florida, <laughs> especially with the uh, humidity, but um, we're only looking at sensible temperature when we're talking about conduction. And so the hottest it gets here for now is um, about 95 degrees sensible heat outside. That gives us a delta T of 20 on, a, on the best, on the hottest day, right? So that drives the heat load that we're having to overcome with our mechanical equipment. Let's go to Chicago just for a second. When it's cold outside, we have a heating set point uh, in the space of like 70. It's usually around 68, 70. Outside could be as low as zero. It could be even lower depending where you are. But you can see that in colder climates, that delta T is much bigger and has the capability of getting much bigger. And so um, that's kind of why here in Florida, as long as we're running at the ASHRAE uh, recommended R values for insulation, and we're making sure that's our assembly value, not just the insulation value, it has to be the average assembly value. That's why adding more insulation and really like spending all your money on insulation doesn't really get you where you wanna go. And in fact, what happens is it will trap heat in the building overnight because what's gonna happen is the only time our building has an opportunity for the heat transfer to actually flow from inside to out is when um, your building's building up heat with the process loads over the night and it's a little cooler outside and it lets some of that heat go to the outdoors. So um, if we end up trapping that process heat, our morning startup for cooling uses a lot more energy. So this is where the word optimize comes into play. And we like to optimize the insulation here. And it isn't necessarily optimizing it by putting a ton of insulation. Um, and ASHRAE's done a pretty good job of optimizing. So that's my spiel on insulation. But you guys made good choices already. <laughs> and you didn't put a ton of insulation on there. So um, knowing that the energy models happen to already have daylight harvesting in them, um, what did team Neutron choose for quarter three? Well, if, if I were to do a quick huddle with my team based on what you just said, <laughs> we might want to switch our answer. <laughs> you can huddle 
publicly. <laughs> we, we talked about coming back and grabbing the roof insulation because we left it bare, thinking that might pick up something. And we, we knew there was some math there with the power density, but we weren't quite sure how to figure that out. Um, I don't know, team, would you rather go back and, and grab, we, we were gonna grab daylight harvesting. Uh, should we grab uh, the light lighting power density and, and max that out instead of the roof insulation? I'm asking my neutron team. Yeah, let's go. Sure, let's Sounds go. Yes. Good. Okay, let's let's do that then. So we'll take the two daylight, the two uh, light options. Okay, all right. All right, team zero. And, and that's B3. Yes, yes, you're taking the point eight. Uh, team zero will also take the daylight harvesting and max out the light power density, so B3. Okay. So I'm going to run these two models. You can welcome to take this as a quick break. Um, this won't take long, uh, so don't go too far, and then we'll take a stretch break. All righty. Well, I'm on team zeros, so why not just go with team zeros first? Um, Okay, team zero, here are your final results. Um, you chose the horizontal rectangle. You added uh, R42 roof insulation to it. Both were just uh, incremental improvements, but you were still sitting at zero. You changed your window glass type, and I will say, we're gonna say that we added daylight harvesting at that same moment uh, because it happened to be turned on. Um, and we have, 15% uh, uh, improvement over the baseline. Then you added uh, four foot shades that gave you another 1%, got up to 16. And then you took your lighting power density from 1.2 down to 0.8, and you landed at a 23% betterment over your baseline. Okay, so you're at 23, remember that. We're gonna go to Team Neutron now. Okay, everybody always just jumps to this number and nobody cares what I'm about to say, but you changed your glass out. We went to horizontal rectangle, then you changed your glass out and added daylight harvesting and got to 14%. Then you increased your window area from 40 to 60, and that actually dropped you by 1%. It was two, shows us two up here, but cumulatively when they're, you know, rounding, it's a 1%. You added, window shades, overhangs, and that put you back to 14, and then you reduced your lighting power density and you got to 20. So team zero is the winner at 23%. And although both teams did very well, 20% or better is really a great, um, you know, we spent in maybe an hour and a half doing this. And we didn't touch the mechanical systems. We never talked about them. And in an hour and a half, we were able to reduce the energy consumption of both buildings by more than 20% just by talking through it and making good choices. Um, and then over on the right hand side, this software actually does um, show the reduction in cooling tons as well. So this would represent first cost. Let's go down to here. And we reduced the amount of cooling tons needed in the building by 50% or 51 really, um, with our effort here. So not only did we touch on operational annual cost of the building during its whole life, we also touched on, um, we also touched on first cost here, all because we set, we made, created this roadmap for us to move forward with design early on. And that's, that's the power of the, you know, doing this early on, creating this schematic level design uh, and running through it. So um, let me go back. I'm going to share a different screen. So here's that everybody asks me, well, what's the right answer, right? Like what's the thing that does the best on this game? And uh, every building's different and is in a different climate and you're never going to have five different rectangular buildings that you get to build and find the perfect fit, right? It's all about optimizing. Um, and so I, but I will tell you this, what I have seen for this game, specifically for this game, right? For a two story, 50,000 square foot building located somewhere in Florida, um, 
climate zone 2A. The rectangular building performs the best. Leave the insulation where it is. Put the better glass on, option one. Reduce your window to wall ratio down to 20%. Because if you think about it, your walls were in R7 and the best possible scenario for the glass is in R2. So um, when you can keep R7 in more spots than R2, it's helpful. Um, that 20% doesn't seem, the daylight harvesting doesn't seem to care. 20% is enough to get your daylight harvesting. So then you move, then you bring it down to 20%. I, al I almost don't like making you guys choose three options because um, you don't always need the overhangs. But if we didn't have to follow the rules of the game, I would just put the overhangs on the south side. And then daylight harvesting, lighting power density reduction in the third quarter. That typically gets it to like 25, 26, 27%. Um, and that's the highest I've ever seen anybody get. So what I'm thinking is I'll take five minutes here to run through a quick case study. Then we're gonna take a long break. And then we'll come back and do the final thing that we're gonna do, which is talk about embodied carbon. All right. This is a quick case study on an existing building because we just talked about a building that doesn't really exist yet, right? And so it's great when we have the opportunity to start at the very beginning of design and work through the process. But what happens when you have an existing building that um, would like to do better or would like to uh, maybe even go for net zero, um, but it's already built? So we're gonna run through this real quick. Selma was nice enough to get me this uh, case study. Um, it's a residence in Sarasota, right? Yep, a residence in Sarasota. It's about 2000 conditioned square feet um, of space, but it has about a th uh, over 3000 square feet of roof because it has a massive overhang that comes over this pool. Um, and so, I wanna show you what, what we can do with very limited information, right? I mean, Selma, you did get me a lot of information too, um, but there was some, um, you know, they have some limitations getting all the stuff. Um, and that's not uncommon. A lot of times I'll just get a handwritten, like this is what we did for the last 12 months. Um, and I kind of have to go figure it out, right? And so, this is what I received primarily, right? Um, from, was this from the owner? Yes, from okay. the owner. Okay, perfect. So I, I received this from the owner. They gave me, which is actually a lot more than I usually get. September 2018 through July 2019, then August 2019 through August 2020. So a full two years, 24 months of data. And I, all I, I, I wrote it in the chat line, but everybody, this is the Umbrella House by Paul Rudolph um, after the renovation. The idea being it's starts at a school architecture. How's it doing if we modeled it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what ended ha up happening, we were going to do this as the other another exercise. I was going to break everyone out into four teams if we had um, more people and we were going to, two of the teams were going to compete with the middle school, two of the teams were going to compete bringing down the energy use of this house, but um, we just didn't have the numbers for that. So instead I decided to run through a quick what I typically do for existing buildings when they want to try and hit net zero. So um, this data is great and I used it, but these notes that the owner happened to write like very kindly write down because we don't always get this level of information actually is what helped me the most. So um, first things first, I knew it was FPL. So I had to, this is blurry, sorry, but I had to go to FPL and dig out their residential utility rates because I didn't know what they were um, and make sure I knew what they were paying. And then I took their data and I graphed it. And that's all I did. I just took their KWH. I also created uh, how much they're paying. Um, obviously, when you're only using electricity, they don't have, they didn't give me any other utility. Like they might have natural gas. I didn't get it. Um, but 
huh? they don't have anything else. Perfect. So when you have only one utility, obviously your cost is going to track very closely to your consumption. Um, the utility rate I just used uh, uh, ten point five, so ten and a half cents per kWh is what FPL looks like they're charging customers. So that's what I used. And I just like to look at it visually because first I need to make sure it looks right, um, that the shape looks right. So you'll see in the down energy use, it's December, January, February. In the up, in the high energy use, it's June, July, August. This is very typical. This is what we would see. So what I can tell by this is that there's no crazy process loads happening inside the building that's causing a more a flatter curve. It's a very weather driven house and the energy use is extremely weather driven. Let's scooch to here. And then I always look at it compared to the cooling and heating degree days because like maybe it was a hot year, maybe it was a cold, but maybe the summer wasn't that bad that year, which is obviously not the case, but um, this blue line represents the cooling degree days, which basically um, your cooling energy should follow that. And this red line follows heating degree days where in our climate, you should have the lowest amount of energy use when that heating is peaking. In the case of these buildings or this building, it's uh, I believe a heat pump, which is very typical for a residential application, um, which means that uh, it's a very efficient way to heat your built, your house, basically. It's not using all just electric heat. Okay, so I looked at this and I was like, okay, great. Nothing crazy, nothing wild is going on here. And I, I tried, we were talking about EUI, right? So this house's EUI is about a 71 EUI and houses are a little funky because they're 24 seven a lot of times. You don't have operating hours for a house. Um, and so uh, it wasn't out of the normal range in my opinion. Um, however, Energy Star, which is what I'll go to to check it against like buildings, doesn't have an Energy Star rating for uh, houses, for single family residences. So I'm just showing you the process. I wasn't able to compare it against like houses, but you know, I was able to com compare it against my house and other houses that I worked on. And I feel like this isn't out of the normal range of a house. So then I was like, okay, what's it going to take to get this thing to net zero, right? It has a lot of roof space, which is great. I was able to go on to the property. So this is what I do. Like I, I kind of feel like I'm stalking people sometimes, but I went onto the property appraiser's website to find out how many bedrooms and baths there were because that plays into the energy use intensity. And I went onto Google Maps and got the roof area just from a quick measurement. And I did take that hole in the roof out um, and then took about 10% more off because you have to, if you're going to put a PV array, you have to be able to walk around it and have space to walk. So I take 10% out of the total roof area in order to get kind of get a more accurate PV array size. Then I go into, so this is called PV Watts Calculator. It's free, available online, and through the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL. And it's extremely easy to use. That's this left-hand side, right? I have my own little Excel calculator that I throw some numbers into. And so this top line here is their total annual KWH for the year and how much they're paying and the amount of available roof area that I think they can use. And then I play around with the, with the sizing of the array um, because I have some rules of thumb that I use. You know, you can fit about 16 watts per square foot of PV on a roof. So I know that that kind of contains my PV size. And I come up with an array size that I think is the max that they can um, fit on their roof. So that was a 61 kW array. And a 61 kW array, according to PV Watts, uh, gets us about 98,000 kWh per year. 
which actually ends up being more than double what they're actually using. So, okay, I answered my first question. Can this project be net, or can this house go net zero with its um, available roof space? The answer is yes. So then just to uh, basically reduce um, the cost, initial first cost of that array, I brought it down to see what it would take to um, be net zero, but not overdo it, not double, you know, the capacity, um, or not not put so much PV that they're doubling what they actually use. And we were able to go from a 61 kW array down to about a 27 kW array, um, which hits just over 100% of their energy use. And then I was saying, you know, the notes were the thing that really helped me out a lot. And the reason is, if you read through these, you'll find out that the house is basically occupied two months out of the year, maybe, and over the course of those 24 months, and that they have rather, um, they have elevated humidity issues in the house because they have jealousies windows, um, which are not good. Jealousies are very not good. <laughs> And so um, that's going to elevate your energy. So I was thinking, well, if anybody decided to live here full time, then um, obviously the energy use is going to go up. So I so I said, you know, based on all this and the notes and everything that I looked at, and by the way, this activity took me 20 minutes to do. That's it. I said, I think they should, you know, if they can afford it, put max out their roof. Because one day if they rent it out or if they occupy it all year round, they'll still be net zero. Um, so that was that was it. That, I just wanted to show you that exercise. That's something that we do a lot. I just did it for another building that we have um, that had some questions about their energy use. And that's really it. All of that is available online for free and very easy and you know intuitive to use. That's that was very it. useful. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I would maybe suggest they switch out their jealousies before it's they pay for that PV. But it's a it's a listed <laughs> building, so that's not going to be an option. Right. Exactly. And we run into that all the time too. So what I'm thinking now, even though Derek, my colleague, for this last presentation just popped in, hey, um, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, really like get the wiggles out and then we'll come back at 1135 in that range and uh, we'll talk about embodied carbon. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay. So home stretch now. Um, this is just a um, just presentation, not not interactive. So you can just sit back and relax. Um, and this is a presentation about embodied carbon. So we've been talking all day about operational carbon. Operational carbon, like we said before, is the carbon that um, is emitted into our atmosphere at the energy plants when um, you know our energy is being generated to be delivered to buildings, right? And operational carbon is something we've been talking about for a long time and has been addressed in a number of ways at the um, code level and at various sustainability rating systems and, and you know, ASHRAE standard levels. Um, we feel like we have a good handle on operational carbon. And then, um, embodied carbon came along and it's been there all along but it's a science that's newer so we're gonna this is what this conversation is about because if we're looking at carbon at a whole carbon pie when it comes to buildings operational is just one part of it and it turns out it's probably only going to be about half um, for all new construction moving forward so here we go my colleague Derek Thompson is presenting with me. Thank you so much for coming on a Sunday and presenting. He'll be, um, his part is uh, 
in the middle of this presentation. And then of course we've we've met, we've already met. Derek is the director of our structural group at TLC. Okay, so carbon. I like to start at the big global level and bring it down, but um, it's hard to talk about it without acknowledging all the things that are happening right now. Um, there's this level of convergence that's going on right now between being on Zeta from our hurricanes, uh, wildfires out west, pandemic, social justice, everything is converging right now and it's not it's not disconnected from climate change and it's not disconnected from how our, our earth um, is changing right now. This is a really cool graphic. If you guys ever go onto NASA's website, this actually will do a time lapse from 19 or 1884 through present day. And it shows the surface of our, temp of our earth, um, the temperature um, over time. And it does it incrementally each year. Um, but you can see, we can see that the Earth's surface is heating, heating up. So what's climate change? Well, climate change is carbon, and that's what we're talking about today. But climate change is a variety of things to a variety of people. It's global warming and greenhouse gas effect. It's social equity. It's extreme weather events, and it's global pandemics. It's, it's a variety of things. And it might not be all of those things to you, but it is something depending on where you live, right? It's very regional in its impact. If you live on the coast, sea level rise impacts you. If you live in a um, you know, glacial area, melting of glaciers impacts you. It can be anything. Um, and it depends on where you live. So breaking it down even further. So what's the big deal about carbon? Well, um, this global warming is happening um, as greenhouse gases get trapped in our atmosphere and carbon dioxide makes up over 80% of those greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide by emission or by global sector, um, if you look at the pie chart on the right, is actually um, broken down industry and transportation uh, are about half of our total uh, carbon emissions. But, but building operations, which is something we just talked about all day, <laughs> and uh, building materials and construction. So building materials and construction is about 11% of the total carbon emissions um, globally. And as we do a better job with our building operations, which we are doing, um, that piece of the pie that is building materials and construction will begin to grow if we don't also tackle that. So that's why we're here today. That's what we're talking about today is the building materials and construction pie. So first let's, let's do this, um, let's define embodied carbon. We already know operational carbon, it's tied tightly to how much energy our building uses, but embodied carbon is the environmental impact associated with extracting, manufacturing and transporting building materials to the job site. And you can see this graphic at the bottom um, the embodied carbon actually applies to almost the full cycle, each cycle of a building's life, while operational is really only when the building is operation in operation. And we, we hope, we plan for that to be 50 years. That's the number everybody says a building is supposed to stay. Um, but the reality is, is it might not be 50 years. And then when it goes away, we have to find a way to dispose of the materials that um, created our building. So I feel like this is a great graphic to show the just the impact of embodied carbon on the cycle of a building. So um, over the next 30 years, if we do business as usual, you can see over on the left of the slide, embodied carbon and operational carbon will be about equal on their impact to that greenhouse gas emissions for, um, for the next 30 years. This is business as usual. Operational carbon, we're doing much better at. So embodied carbon is where we now can focus some time and effort to start bringing that down. And um, it's worth noting that operational carbon, like you can do better things to your building as technology advances right? People built 
buildings with uh, fluorescent lights 10 years ago, and they're retrofitting them with LED lights now. That brings down the operational carbon uh, and the energy use in your building. However, once you build a building, the embodied carbon is locked. It doesn't go anywhere, you can't change it. So making decisions early, educated and um, data-driven uh, decisions early is really key to reducing the embodied carbon in our buildings. So the AIA's Design for Excellence Framework, which is formally the COAT framework, um, is, is already talking about embodied carbon. They've already been taken into consideration. I like to bring it in because I know a lot of uh, groups are designing toward these measures and using them as a roadmap for design. So uh, measure six, design for energy, and measure eight, design for resources, are really the two measures within this framework that you'll find embodied carbon. Um, and operational carbon also exists in measure six as well. So who's talking about this? Who's setting goals? Who's doing this? Well, um, we happened to talk about Architecture 2030 Challenge early on in this, uh, early on in the day when we were talking about the WD Suggs uh, Middle School case study. Um, we use Architecture 2030 a lot to report our design criteria and the performance of our buildings and also as a basis to see how we're doing. Uh, but 2030, Architecture 2030 is doing a lot. Um, surrounding both operational. So that's all operational carbon. They're also doing a ton surrounding embodied carbon. They're one of the leading groups that's doing a lot of the research right now and helping set goals. So the 2030 challenge for embodied carbon out of architecture 2030 uh, has set a goal for zero embodied carbon emissions by 2040. And because this is very Embodied carbon is so tightly woven with the material selections that are made when um, designing a building. Um, they, they really set a fairly um, aggressive target, but I think it's doable because um, the architecture industry, and you'll see next, the structural industry really has so much um, say in how this is gonna go. So this is where I hand it over to Derek because the Structural Engineering Institute, SEI, is also looking at embodied carbon and setting their own goals. Definitely. So I would imagine that each of you, this isn't the first time you've heard of embodied carbon. So it's almost like we're preaching to the choir here. It's like every time I go to a conference and see a great presentation, I'm like, so-and-so needs to hear this, but they're not here. So thank you guys for being here and listening to this. Um, you know, the question really becomes, what are we as a design and construction industry going to do about this? You know, can we even do anything? Uh, the answer to that is a yes. And, and that yes is pervasive and it's relevant in every aspect of the industry from owners and architects to engineers and fabricators and suppliers. Uh, and this is the thing that you're going to hear me repeat over and over today. You have to, or you've, you know, you've probably heard the old African adage, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, net zero is our child and we all play a huge role in this maturity. Uh, the first step really is to embrace a commitment to get to net zero emissions for this to happen. You know, is it going to happen all at once? Uh, no, it's not, but it, we get that. Uh, the Structural Engineering Institute, though, has created the SE 2050 Challenge. And, you know, you guys have already looked at the Architecture 2030, and they've got their own challenge, both with the same goals um, to address the embodied carbon, operational carbon, primarily the operational carbon, uh, making incremental changes to how we, you know, do things and rewarding projects that achieve the set goals uh, so the world at large tenants and others can take notice and turn in and reward those that make progress toward a net zero embodied carbon future. Uh, while the target dates vary, things will evolve and change as we unite and better understand how to define the carbon that's embodied in the construction of the buildings. So I think the first thing that we have to look at um, to the future of sustainable design, we need to recognize how far we've come as an industry. LEED, well building, green globes, these are programs that have done tremendous things to help the operational carbon output for their buildings. Uh, we've greened the day-to-day -day use as well. All these various programs have done some to address the building materials we use and the processes we use to get our buildings built, which is embodied carbon, but there's a lot of opportunity remaining. And now that we're getting to the process, we're getting the process of operationally green. Uh, we need to challenge ourselves to take it to the next step because operational carbon re reduction, while great, is not enough. 
So where are those opportunities? In the structure, there's actually a lot of opportunities to continue the path to net zero embodied carbon future. All of these sectors, or of all of these sectors, residential, oh, go back one. Residential offers a large portion of the opportunity right along with commercial and commercial residential. In the chart on the left, we see that the types of construction dominate the overall picture. On the right, we see the annual carbon dioxide emissions associated with the various types of building materials broken down by these sectors. The commercial and residential are both large users of concrete and make up much of the right-hand chart. Steel and wood off also opportunity, some opportunity for reductions in embodied carbon, but not to the same degree that co concrete does. Keep in mind though, that through podiums and foundations, steel framed and wood frame projects still involve a considerable amount of concrete in many cases. And masonry, not shown explicitly on the list, but also, is also extremely common in the building construction, and it's also a concrete product. Everything's you know, pretty tangled together. The key takeaway from these charts, though, is that, that the concrete, all the slightly purplish shaded areas on the chart on the right, accounts for nearly 80% of the carbon dioxide emissions in the construction across all these types of construction. That's massive. Ultimately, the two questions become, what's the total net embodied carbon involved in our projects from cradle to building? And that's a difficult question to answer as we'll see later. And what can we do to reduce the carbon embodied in our projects to a net zero so we're impacting our environment less every time we build? Okay, so let's move on to the how of reducing carbon. This is a big question and it can be approached in many ways. As it relates to the SE 2050 challenge, there are four primary prongs to an overall approach of achieving net zero in buildings. One, refine the structural design, and we're gonna spend the majority of our time on this prong. Uh, the second one is fabricate with renewable power, power sources. The third, produce and use structural materials more efficiently. And the fourth, utilize carbon offsets. The good news is that there's not a pick only one approach. In fact, the best approach is to use these in combination. And as we'll see, each, appro each approach tends to influence the others. As we've already said, something you should pick up throughout this presentation, and especially as we walk through these approaches, is that all of these require commitment from far more than just the structural engineers to succeed. Um, we as engineers can certainly take the lead on some of these, but our industry partners, you guys, the architects, contractors, and manufacturers all play a huge role. So let's dig in a little bit more and discuss these in detail. Uh, the first one, a refining structural design involves structural engineers primarily taking the lead. We can always do things to refine our design, though many times we must make sure that we properly coordinate with you guys, MEP and, and everyone else on the project. Certainly a lighter structure can help reduce raw materials in the superstructure. It reduces the size of the foundations and the columns and in seismic areas, it reduces the mass of the building. That obviously in turn reduces the overall material quality quantities needed. So with that goal in mind, the structural engineer is continually working to optimize our beams and girders during the design. But what can hold us back is that the smallest or lightest shape, especially in steel, isn't always the most efficient shape. Uh, as we'll note here, the, or as we note here, the devil's in the details. And if we continually optimize the structure and every beam is sized differently, the amount of carbon emitted in the in the efforts of preparing formwork or in fabricating many different connections could outweigh the use of more standardized design. So we have to be careful and there's always a balance in life. The second point here, as well as the third, involve optimizing the structure by coordinating intensively with other stakeholders in the design process. During the design, one of the most effective tools in the team's arsenal is working collaboratively in a give and take to make sure that we truly optimize the architecture and structure hand in hand. Small changes to the layout, such as providing slightly longer shear walls can be very advantageous over using uh, a, a purely frame-based system. The goal is to adjust the floor plans and exterior walls a little here and there together to reach an optimum design that reduces embodied carbon. I mentioned performance design because that's another way we can coordinate as a team. Uh, we can also work with the owner and design team to set goals for resilient buildings. If we design a bit more for tomorrow's expected forces and nat nature's evolution, there might be an initial embodied carbon hit, but over the long, longer building life, we'll see an overall reduction in the net embodied carbon. 
All this plays into what we call life cycle analysis. Through refining the structure design alone, SEI estimates that we could see a potential 10% to 25% emissions in the fabrication and construction processes. <laughs> yeah, so specifications. The structural plans, you know, obviously they influence the embodied carbon content through the sizes of the beams and the members, the foundations and so forth. But often the, ne the often neglected side of structural design is the project specifications. We just do them as we always have and that status quo really isn't good, good enough anymore. In some ways, here's where our design actually can play a much bigger role. We all have got to become more educated on how we edit specs to match the spe specific projects embodied carbon goals. That can get us there a lot further or a lot quicker than some of the other things can. You know, I've learned recently that I'm not the only engineer to realize the massive potential uh, sustainable impact for project specifications. Um, you know, recycled content's great keeping materials local and avoiding lots of carbon emissions from transport is awesome. But, uh, you know, both of them re reduce the carbon numbers for the structural to some degree and every bit counts, but we've got to go further. We've got to all gain a better understanding of manufacturing processes of our building materials and learn more about conversations such as modular or panelized construction. For instance, we need to understand the potentially large impacts of embodied carbon numbers that just the selection of a specific kiln can make on cement and hence the concrete. The same goes for blast furnaces and steel manufacturing. And construction waste, it's something that we're all familiar with. Visit any job site, even new homes being built in your community, and you'll see an overwhelming, overflowing dumpsters and whole shattered concrete masonry blocks, long but no longer usable segments of lumber, discarded formwork and the like. If we become educated as a whole design team, the reductions in embodied carbon are additive and from all the little changes and adjustments to material specifications for everything from framing to finishes, it all adds up. And we call work and we call to work to under, we call to understand the LCA for all of our materials to keep a long term perspective in our calculations for embodied carbon. Bottom line, just specifying better materials could result in 10 to 25% emissions reduction and specifying processes that reduce construction waste has another potential five to 10%. So we end up potentially with a 15 to 35% reduction in body carbon from the specification edits alone. So as we've discussed so far, this is not just something for structural engineers. This goes you know, far beyond um, just us to do, you know, to get to net zero. Uh, for instance, the chart here on the left is called uh, Tela Five Bricks. I don't know if anyone's seen this or not, uh, but it has an architect, Brad Benke, uh, found that changes to a veneer to backup system used in brick veneers can have huge impacts on embodied carbon. At the far left uh, was his baseline, a thin brick on concrete. Moving through the various alternatives, which include even full brick options, uh, he found that a large reduction in embodied carbon <clears throat> for the cladding uh, he was studying was achieved by going to a thin brick over a cement board with metal stud backup. The image on the right shows how optimizing the way plaster finishes are applied to metal stud wall can reduce the embodied carbon up to 22%. So again, small changes with a team goal can get us to net zero. Okay, so this chart actually takes a bit of divergence from what we've been looking at, uh, but I really wanted to impact or show the impact of different materials. Um, the previous charts really looked at construction type and then you know what what each one of those um, materials possess, uh, but. Also, we want to consider the intensity of the embodied carbon in each material, and that's what this chart speaks to. Uh, you can see there that aluminum, it's, it's because of the way it's harvested, uh, it really takes the cake and, and you know, the EC numbers. In fact, it's 100 times the amount of concrete, so you know, a little bit goes a long way. Uh, same with fiberglass. I mean, those numbers are really up there. So we have to look at what materials are being selected and the quantities on any given project. Uh, here again, uh, remember, we have to you know, look at an example here on the right of carbon insulation. Um, we've got to give consideration to both the emissions and in making the insulation, but also how much carbon gets trapped in the material and can't go to contribute to global warming uh, for as long as it's in the building. I'm sure you guys have heard of sequestered carbon before, but it, it's one of the things that go into what makes calculating total embodied carbon so tricky. Uh, these calculations become a bit like weather modeling. Um, but you can see here, you know, the uh, extruded polystyrene gives off quite a bit where straw bales actually absorb and, and sequester a lot of carbon. So we have some options there. 
a uh, lot of variables in play. Uh, getting a good estimate on embodied carbon can be tough. And sometimes we have to focus on emissions associated with our materials more than anything else at this point. So thinking cradle to grave, um, or cradle to grave, cradle to building, um, and how it impacts our choices of material selection, we eventually want to consider the whole supply chain and the impacts beyond just emissions and assessing the sustainability of our designs. Steel particularly is intrusive and in how the raw iron ore is mined. The environmental impacts of mining extend far beyond emissions. Can we capture that in our estimates or assessments? No, not yet. But again, we all need to be thinking about these things. And as we become aware of them, it will impact the way we design. As an industry, we need to look about, we need to think about how we can improve how we do things. Um, and we can recycle, can we recycle materials instead of using virgin materials to avoid some of these less quantifiable impacts on the environment? Um, second point uh, on the four prongs is uh, fabricating with renewable power sources. You know, can we change the way that we even manufacture things? You know, we know the industry is slow to change and adopt new technologies, but there are a lot of new technologies and they're becoming increasingly available. So some of this ties back to the first prong since we as a design team can lead the industry by specifying new processes to achieve embodied carbon targets. But before we talk about um, the changing the elements of manufacturing itself, one of the easier goals is to ask the energy in industry to use energy from renewable power sources, wind, solar, et cetera. Uh, whether it's a blast steel furnace, the manufacturing plant for concrete masonry blocks, the rolling equipment for steel shapes, or a kiln for making the clinker from which cement, cement is made, uh, if we can get those high energy draw processes on renewable, renewable energy, we're making massive strides in the more sustainable uh, projects. To do this, the whole team has got to know how much uh, green power supply manufacturer or where, where it's available. And we have to be able to work with the contractor and owner so that everyone knows what's being specified and why. Uh, we, need to, we really have to have the buy-in from everyone, uh, from the owner down, uh, for these things to work. Uh, the third one is producing and using structural materials more efficiently. Um, of course, each step of manufacturing new technologies allow uh, us to use energy more efficiently. So in addition to or separately from using renewable power sources, uh, we can discuss specifying known and available manufacturing technologies. As example, um, cement, when it's made from raw materials, the kiln in which the clinker is created is heated to nearly 1500 degrees. I mean, that's a lot of energy, uh, but there are alternative materials uh, generation processes coming online in the industry. Uh, for instance, if we were to use a dry kiln with a preheater or a precalcinator kiln in the cement mixing process, that cement will use up to 85 less thermal energy than some of the alternative kiln types. Another lever we can pull is to use different types of cement and additives to our concrete mixes. The impacts of the structural strength and durability must be considered, but alter alternatives such as low lime calcium silicate cement do not require the same super high kiln temperatures and hence result in energy saving and a reduction to the overall embodied carbon content for the project using this type of concrete. Another thing, uh, electric arc furnaces, um, EAFs, they're used in steel production and they're a lot more efficient than coal fired traditional blast furnaces. Uh, and now, you know, we see energy optimized furnaces coming online. Um, how does this impact you know, embodied carbon? Less energy used in fabrication of the steel makes a tremendous impact even if the project is concrete framed because of reinforcing steel, post-tensioning steel, lots of things to a lesser degree, but it still adds up. For steel made in the US, where most of the steel production comes from recycling steel, uh, also nicely sustainable, EA EAFs are very common, but overseas, uh, where so-called virgin steel is manufactured, uh, blast furnaces such as, or called BF, BOFs, are much more common and dominate steel production because coal firing uses basic technology. So where your steel comes from can make a huge difference in the embodied carbon content of the project. You know, when it comes to wood, you know, everyone thinks that it's naturally green. And in some ways it really is. It's probably the least impactful material in many respects, not at least of which because wood is naturally sequestered. It naturally sequesters about 25% of the carbon that's released. Um, we know this, but did you know that, you know, where the wood is harvested makes a huge difference? Uh, because while wood sequesters carbon, using wood redu reduces our forest acreage, which in turn impacts the world's ability to sequester carbon uh, in an ongoing sense. 
So when it comes to wood, we should always seek to ensure that projects use raw material from sustainable forests that are certified by Forest Stewardship Council or the FSC. Uh, this will enable us to not only use renewable sustainable material for a project, but also ensure that the project isn't offsetting the benefits negatively by using lumber that will reduce the world's capacity for carbon sequestration. Um, next, you know, on the reuse uh, of materials more efficiently, um, this is particularly true of reusing buildings. You know, if we can, if we can get a building with good bones available, why not? You know, LEED and other systems already give credit to those who do, and governments incentivize it with programs such as historic tax credits. You know, in addition to reusing buildings, we can use reclaimed or salvaged materials, either from another portion of the project or from a different building altogether. Doing so is a great way to reduce emissions, depending on, of course, how far the material needs to be transported and how heavy it has to, or have, how heavy it is. Um, as you see here, the combined Combined, we could save 10 to 25% in carbon emissions simply by reusing existing buildings and existing materials. Okay, and finally, carbon offsets. Uh, you know, I would say use these sparingly. Um, certainly they should be third party verified. Um, SEI calls them investments and in actions that reduce carbon emissions. And you'll hear these in, in, in discussions surrounding embodied carbon. So I wanted to mention them here uh, and make, you, you know, make sure that you were aware they exist. Uh, they can be a way as we start down the path of reducing embodied carbon to help your, your project achieve its goals in theory. Uh, but as we look at combining various approaches to sustainable design and construction, as we just discussed, uh, carbon offsets should be, you know, they should be minimized and, and really used as a last resort. You know, my recommendation would always be to seek to achieve your targets uh, for your project uh, with, with the things that you can do for your project, uh, not with someone else's actions. I, you know, use these if you must, um, but sparingly. SEI has a quote on their um, website. It says, combining design strategies, electrical grid improvements, and manufacturing improvements, the built infrastructure can transition to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, even without the use of carbon offsets. So really, of those four prongs, the optimum approach for structural engineers and architects and contractors and owners and the industry partners uh, will be a combined one. You know, focusing solely on changing the way we design by, by, by the structure, uh, our structure by the numbers are focusing solely on using green power grids, supporting, uh, supported manufacturers uh, won't get us there. Uh, when we talk about all four approaches defined by SEI and combine them, we can see that we, we can make some great strides toward a net, embodied car net zero embodied carbon. The far right column shows our current status quo. Uh, so today, designing materials play a very small role in the structural world, and that's, you know, that's not okay. We would need a lot of carbon offsets to purchase, uh, to reach a net zero uh, energy carbon goal for any of the projects with that mentality. Um, but there is an option here from the second from the right, uh, that's idea, ideal, employing our knowledge about reducing EC during design and our material specifications and our selection of manufacturing and power grids all in a way that we won't need to pull the offsets lever to reach the goals. Um, you know, as we've said before, calculating net embodied carbon in the building is a real challenge uh, with all the variables at play. And we're doing the best we can with the tools and development by various committees. Uh, SEI has an embodied carbon action plan or ECAP uh, that helps design teams, owners, and other members of the industry understand the steps that can be taken. Uh, this plan will be refined and grow over time. Um, they also have a ECOM or embodied carbon rough order of magnitude. Uh, the Carbon Leadership Forum developed this tool a few years ago uh, for estimating embodied carbon. Uh, these tools are all in growth and development stage and, and don't yet represent a complete building LCA. But over time, as we have more people come on board and make the commitment, uh, we'll have more data coming. And then with more data, we'll be able to refine these tools. Um, the great thing is, is that, you know, all these organizations are referencing each other and they're working hard to push the boundaries of how we can uh, assess the net embodied carbon in the buildings uh, with the goal of reducing the impact of the, uh, of our, you know, of the impact on the environment, and minimize global warming. This uh, last slide here that I have anyway, kind of shows, you know, two different buildings. Uh, the one on the left uh, it really employs the different strategies. That's actually an 18 story um, mass timber frame. Um, and they're, they're doing a great job and have really uh, utilized all the different approaches. 
and to not throw the other building under the bus because lots of our buildings look like that. Uh, but you can see that you know the energy or the uh, uh, offsets are playing too large of a role in that. And as we really start to have more conferences like this and have people uh, like yourself get more involved, uh, we'll start to see these uh, these offsets come down and completely eliminated, hopefully uh, by 2050. Okay. Yeah, um, so continuing on with this embodied carbon conversation, um, as you can see from this pie chart uh, for a single building, the superstructure and the substructure and the cladding are well over 50%, right? Um, TLC is a structural firm, but we're also an MEP firm. So we like to take a look at all of the systems that we have um, that we're designing and see what we can do. Mechanical, electrical, and plumbing um, are about 10% of the pie when it comes to embodied carbon. Um, and it's smaller than structure, but it doesn't mean we don't want to do something about it. Um, of course, a more complicated project like a hospital, perhaps that has a large mechanical equipment will probably be a little bit larger slice of the pie. So, and it's, it is important to note that MEP systems have a direct impact on the embodied carbon of a building. So the materials that are going into the equipment have their own amount of embodied carbon, but they also have an indirect impact as well. And we'll talk about that. So here's the same chart, right? But we're looking at it through an MEP lens now instead of a structural uh, lens. And we'll see that the, a lot of the materials that go into MEP systems are fairly high in embodied carbon. So we've got galvanized steel and aluminum that goes into our ductwork. We've got insulation, we've got copper that goes into our wiring and our piping, and we've got <clears throat> plastic, which is piping and wire sheathing. So um, now we don't use by volume as much of this material, these materials as you would in the structure. So the final count um, and contribution of these materials when they when it comes to MEP systems is smaller than the structural, but it's still worth looking at. And then uh, groups like Building Green, which um, I I happen to sit on one of the peer groups, uh, the Sustainable MEP Leaders Group. Uh, we are trying to push the industry forward because there isn't a lot of transparency on MEP equipment. We've got transparency and energy um, environmental product declarations or EPDs on a lot of structural components like steel and concrete. And you can get quick answers and there's a lot of data for that, those materials. But when it comes to these assemblies, like an air handling unit, it, it is comprised of so many different materials that came from a variety of different places. There isn't a lot of transparency for the final product. So we're trying to push the industry, the MEP, um, industry to provide more transparency. So the direct impacts, right? Um, so first things first, uh, we're gonna also, we're gonna talk about the direct impacts of refrigerants. So we've got the materials that go into our equipment. And then we also have the whole way that we create cooling, which is refrigerants. Refrigerants have, uh, are very radiative in their impacts. So they stick around in the atmosphere for a long time and they have their own component. They are their own greenhouse gas. So you can see in the pie chart on the left, carbon dioxide from forestry and other land use and then the carbon dioxide in blue for fossil fuel, those all add up to about the 80% um, that we had talked about before for greenhouse gases, but that orange slice of the pie, the fluorinated gases is refrigerants. And while it's a smaller slice of the pie, they have more radiative impact on the atmosphere because they stick around longer. Our earth is not naturally um, set up to exchange and do the typical cycle uh, that it does with carbon with fluorinated gases. Um, and so they are being phased out. The har more harmful ones are being phased out, um, but they still have an impact on our atmosphere. And so the question becomes, is there a future where cooling can be accomplished with harmless refrigerants? And that's something that the industry is um, starting to look more into now. But we also have to look at indirect impacts, right? We've talked about in, uh, operational carbon all day, and you guys saw in the SD Wizard how 
just bringing the energy use of your building and making good choices in schematic design was able to bring the energy use of your building down by, let's say, 23%, 20% what the teams hit. We also looked at the peak cooling tons, and the peak cooling tons is direct first cost and direct first sizing of your mechanical equipment. So what holds up mechanical equipment? Structure. <laughs> the structure is holding up our cooling towers. If they go on the roof, they're holding up our air handling units and the weight of these device or of these this equipment is driving the size of our structure a lot of times. And so one thing, get our lo loads down in the building and right size our equipment so that we're not oversizing our equipment and having to support it with our structure. And two, if we have heavy equipment that's going on the roof that we want to, um, like cooling towers is uh, the prime example, let's find a way to get them on grade if we can. Let's take structure completely out of the equation because that will reduce the size of the structure up at the roof significantly. And like I said, I'm part of this uh, MEP Sustainable Leaders group with Building Green and we we actually just finished up our letter that we're going to send next to a couple of the large overarching mechanical organizations like AHRI and ASHRAE asking them to help us push more transparency in the industry so we can make choices based around data um, because right now that data is not available. And I do just want to like provide a, a quick whole life cycle warning, um, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about selection of materials, which is largely what we have um, control over. And one day those that building will get replaced by another building or will get torn down. They're, they're, the face of construction waste is changing every day. What we could recycle yesterday, we are not able to recycle right now. We're struggling right now. Um, carpet and drywall were two items that were just uh, in the bag. We were able to recycle them anywhere, anytime, and now barely anybody's taking them. Um, and so you don't know what construction waste, the construction waste in industry and demolition waste industry is going to look like in 50 years, 40 years, 30 years. So let's do all we can at the front end and not depend because uh, when we do a life cycle cost analysis, it does take into account the grave portion of cradle to grave, but let's not depend too much on that because we, on the grave side, because we don't know what it's going to look like in 40, 50 years. <clears throat> so how do we do this, right? Well, we were able to walk through the process of taking a baseline building and reducing it down incrementally um, on the operational side. And that's essentially what you do here. In our SD wizard exercise, we took an energy model to do this, to basically validate our choices, our design choices. And here for embodied carbon, we would use a whole building life cycle analysis tool. So first things first, reduce, reuse, recycle. So I show the picture in the middle is the Empire State Building and it was our title cover slide as well. The Empire State Building is a prime example of a building that just finished up uh, a long, many year re full scale renovation. Um, it's gotten a lot of press. It's gotten a lot of press on both it, um, its energy efficiency and the goals that they set and the scale of it. It was a massive renovation um, to bring it up to, up to date, basically. And that's Reusing a building is one of the best ways to avoid a large amount of embodied carbon in your building. If you can't reuse or you're building on a green field and you know you're building a whole new building, uh, use a life cycle cost analysis or a life cycle analysis tool, whole building life cycle analysis tool, or make product selections and material selections based on databases like um, ICE, which is an inventory for carbon. Oh gosh, it escaped me, but it's a, a, I'll try to pull up the website after this. It's a, it's a extensive um, database of products that all show all the life cycle carbon 
embodied in them um, for, for hundreds and hundreds of materials. So it's an excellent resource. Set a project embodied carbon goal initially, early in design, just like we're setting an EUI goal on the operational side, set an embodied carbon goal, and then hold that final design accountable for that goal. Don't just be like, oh, we didn't make it. Oh, well, you know, maybe figure out why. If you're not going to necessarily hit that goal, let's figure out why we didn't hit it so next time we can hit it. Um, I will say this. Um, operational carbon and reducing it has a very good um, economic story to it, right? It'll save the owner money on the back end. <clears throat> Embodied carbon probably doesn't have that same impact. At least we don't have quantifiable numbers right now to show that. So it's not necessarily something that you have to, if the owner wants to be involved, great, but it's not something that we have to get necessarily buy-in from the owner all the time because these are just ways that our industry is gonna change in its design process. Not necessarily trying to push it um, on an owner level um, and if they're engaged, then fabulous. Um, but it is still, th they are things that we can look at with or without the owner's buy-in. And then I, I love that where traditionally there hasn't really been a significant role for structural engineers in the world of sustainability, we haven't involved them as much as we probably could have. They can now step into this forefront as pioneers towards decarbonizing the built environment. Um, and that's good because they have the energy to do it. Whereas those of us doing operational carbon have been doing this for a long time and we feel we've kind of squeezed the lemon all the way with the technology that's available right now. So it's, it's great that we can get this fresh perspective um, and architects as well um, on the cladding and wall materials. You know, there's a lot of energy out there that people are ready to dive into. These tools exist. We've been talking about life cycle analysis. They exist. You have Athena, um, which I think a lot of people have heard of. You have Tally, which is another one a lot of people have heard of. Those are life cycle analysis tools. Um, you also just have that ICE database, which you can just, you know, if you're not going to actually do the calculation for the life cycle, you can still make choices based on the data that's out there. There's the EC3 database that we've talked about already, and this ECOM tool on SEI's website, the Structural Engineering Institute's website, is it's specific to structure, but as we saw, if we just look at structure, we're going to make a significant impact. So there's a lot of tools available out there already. So who is responsible for embodied carbon? Everyone, all of us, right? It's us, it's our job as an industry to help uh, people understand what it is and to start using the tools to reduce this embodied carbon. It's also gonna push the industry, the material production industry to start making better choices as well. And then who's talking about it? If you guys want to go learn about more about embodied carbon, do a little deep dive. If you like to research um, Building Green, Architecture 2030, SEI 2050, uh, and the carbon leadership form, I would say those are the top four that are really, really diving deep and talking about this. It is absolutely somewhat new science relative to other science. The data is changing every day. And you might look up building green and then go to Architecture 2030 and see the same chart showing what you think should be the same information. They have different numbers. That's okay. Don't let that keep you from diving into this and doing something. So I always like to send this presentation off with a call to action because what good would it do if I didn't tell you how to do this stuff or at least help you get your first foot in the door? So like I said, embodied carbon is new science, but don't let that stop you from doing something, particularly looking at the structure. That's a great place to start. And these tools exist. They're already there. You don't have to look around for them. You don't have to wait for them to be developed. If you just focus on structure only, take that first tiny bite, you know, of this topic, you're going to make an, a, a significant impact 
in the embodied carbon of the building. So set those girl goals early, hold that final project accountable to meeting those goals and do a quick lessons learned on if it doesn't meet it, why didn't it meet it? What we couldn't, you know, the budget didn't support getting concrete from or steel from such and such location because it was slightly more expensive. Not to say that's always gonna be the case, but um, you know, there are reasons behind not being able to make your ideal selection. Let's quantify that and figure out what happened so that we can move forward. And then of course, as we all um, bring that operational carbon down, continue to bring it down, the embodied carbon slice of the pie is gonna continue to grow and it's going to exceed operational carbon soon. So we need to hit embodied carbon now. This is not a doomsday kind of declaration. It's just like an encouragement <laughs> for everybody to like go back to their desks and think, okay, maybe we should, maybe we should have a quick meeting about where this concrete's coming from. And maybe we should look at where the steel's coming from. Um, just those tiny little moments in a design can make a large impact um, and can tell a good story too. Uh, that you can use for the next project. So go out there and uh, start looking at the embodied carbon on your projects. 